warm welcome to everyone for this uh, very special uh, panel event on the Russian Revolution and global development, uh, lessons from the first hundred years. My name is Fazia Smile, and I teach in development studies uh, here at SOAS. We have an extremely knowledgeable and distinguished panel with us today to discuss not only what the Revolu Russian Revolution was about, but its lessons and its legacy. As many of you will know, the revolution began in February 1917 in the middle of the First World War with a demonstration on International Women's Day demanding bread, peace and land. It ultimately turned into a process in which workers, peasants and soldiers began to take control of their own destinies. On the 25th of February, there was a general strike and the Tsar ordered troops to attack the protests and arrest the leaders. On the 27th of February, the first army units mutinied and went over to the side of the revolution, which was a decisive moment uh, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate. By October, workers, peasants and soldiers were leading the greatest anti-capitalist uprising in history as ordinary people overthrew the state and started to run society for themselves. A new kind of democracy was epitomized in the Soviets, workers, peasants and soldiers councils, which were created to run the new state. And this would involve running the economy in the interests of working people, not the elite few. Political democracy was linked to economic democracy. Women won rights around divorce and abortion. Homosexuality was de decriminalized. Oppressed nations and nationalities had rights to secede. And there was an explosion of creativity in the arts and culture. This new society was showing the way towards emancipation for working people around the world and had the potential to provide for the free development of all. So the significance of the Russian Revolution can't be underestimated, and I think the lessons are instructive for struggles today. So we're very pleased uh, that Tarek Ali, August Nims, and uh, Tamas Kraus can be here to explain and analyze this important event for us. Uh, so the way it will work is um, I will introduce each speaker in turn. They'll speak for about um, 20 uh, to, to 25 minutes. We'll have a, um, a few rounds of questions from the floor and then speakers will come back um, for, for last comments. Um, if you're tweeting the hashtags or if you'd like to just follow our tweets are uh, SOASDEVSTUDIES, hashtag SOASDEVSTUDIES, that's all one word, um, and ESRC. So uh, first we hear from, from August Nims. August is Professor of Political Science and African American and African Studies, and he's also a distinguished teaching professor, professor at the University of Minnesota. He's a leading thinker on socialist strategy, race in the United States, and politics in Africa. And he's written numerous books, including a two-volume uh, book on Lenin's electoral strategy, um, Marx, Tocqueville, and Race in America, and uh, Marx and Engels, their contribution to the Democratic breakthrough. And I should also say that um, uh, August uh, uh, first came to SOAS in 1968 to do some research. Um, and though he's been back numerous times, I think it's very nice to be able to welcome him again um, 50 years later. So we'll hear from August. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Faisal. I want to thank you and Alfredo for uh, inviting me to be, uh, to be here to take uh, uh, participate, take part in this uh, important uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I uh, want to begin, I'm glad there's a, see a clock there's a, in the back of the wall so I can <laughs> be under discipline here. Uh, I want to um, begin my comments with a couple of premises that I begin with in looking at the uh, Bolshevik uh, and the Russian Revolution. Uh, firstly, to make sense of it, it has to be seen within global global and historical context uh, to appreciate its uh, significance, to, uh, to, to appreciate what was achieved uh, 100 years ago. Second, uh, my other premise is that a distinction must be made between a revolutionary process such as 1917 and the betrayal, the betrayal of a revolutionary process in the late 1920s. Uh, and the betrayal of a revolution need not impugn uh, the revolution itself. The betrayal or overthrow of reconstruction, for example, uh, radical reconstruction in the United States after the Civil War, doesn't impugn what was achieved in that 10-year period, nor does the uh, overthrow of the Paris Commune 
in April of uh, 1871 impugned what the communists <coughs> achieved in the two and a half years. And the same can be said about subsequent developments, such as the events in Tahrir Square in 2011. So that's an, uh, that's an assumption I'm making. And we can have a discussion later on about what happened, uh, what explains the betrayal uh, of the Bolshevik Revolution in the late 1920s. In other words, a counter-revolution is not prima facie evidence for something inherently problematic, that something is inherently problematic with the revolutionary process itself. Uh, th that has to be proven rather than, than assumed. Uh, I argue that political contingency best explains uh, the Stalinist uh, counter-revolution. All right. Uh, the big picture, the world in which we live today, that's what I begin with. And I'm referring, of course, to the crisis of uh, late capitalism. This is the world in which we, we live, in which the defenders of capitalism uh, admit uh, that this is an unprecedented uh, development. Some of them have taken to calling it secular uh, stagnation. And many of them admit they, are, they have no solutions to the, to the crisis. And there's been a political reaction. The Trump election, in many ways, along with other elections in Western Europe and elsewhere, are in many ways reactions, reactions, political reactions to the, uh, to the crisis. And uh, what capitalists have in store uh, to solving this crisis is what they've always done in the past, and that is to take it out on the backs of uh, working people. And what's going on in Greece at this moment, and also in Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico at this particular moment, uh, is what is foreshadowed for working people in the more advanced uh, capitalist uh, world. Uh, the working class is back at the central stage uh, of, um, of politics. Uh, there were many people in the academy who, who had written off the, the working class and thought that that was a, uh, a development from the past. And if you were in the world of uh, postmodernism, uh, you simply were not prepared. Uh, for this particular moment in which we are, we are living. The task for the working class, then, is in order to avoid this crisis uh, being taken out, out of the hides of working people is how to take power. How, do, how does the working class uh, take power? That's the question, and in my opinion, that's the significance of what the Bolsheviks, what the Bolsheviks did in October of 1907, 1917. I think for much of the post-World War II uh, politics, world politics, uh, the revolutionary process was in the so-called third world. And the third world, uh, in my opinion, that revolutionary process is in many ways has ebbed, has been ebbing uh, for, quite some, for quite some time. And the capitalist crisis that we are talking about now um, means that the working class in the advanced capitalist world uh, becomes more and more at the center uh, of the stage of world, of world uh, politics. And for that reason, it's my view that the big political problem that our side faces within the advanced capitalist countries is what is the relationship between the revolutionary process and electoral and parliamentary politics? Uh, if there was one thing that the Occupy movement uh, revealed, was how do you negotiate uh, the streets uh, and the electoral parliamentary uh, process? And un this is a reality unlike, I think, for in the third world where the electoral parliamentary process never had the weight and the significance it did uh, his for all kinds of historical reasons within the advanced capitalist, uh, capitalist countries. Um, and I think it's important for us. We have an obligation to go back and understand where parliaments come from. And I can't think of any better place to begin that by be beginning here in, uh, in the UK, beginning in England, uh, going back to the origins of uh, parliamentary processes. And I think the, Eng uh, the English Civil Wars is a good place to begin. Uh, what the levelers uh, taught us, and especially what uh, Gerard Wynne Stanley uh, taught us in 1649 uh, about the uh, uh, limits, the limits of uh, 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 what would be called later bourgeois democracy, the fact that to, as long as, and this was Wynne Stanley's argument, as long as uh, social inequalities exist, popular sovereignty uh, can't be realized. 
as long as social inequalities exist, popular, uh, popular sovereignty, true democracy uh, can't be realized. And that insight, I think, is exactly the insight that the young Karl Marx and Frederick Engels uh, 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 arrived at uh, 200, 200 uh, years, years later. How to make use of the electoral parliamentary process. I think there's no better place to begin than with Lenin. Lenin and what the Bolsheviks did over the course of not just 1917, but beginning in 1905 and 1906. Uh, and what Lenin, drawing on the lessons from Marx and Engels, and especially, in my opinion, a most important document called the 1850 Address of the, Cent of the Central Authority authority of the League, the League, uh, the Communist League in 1850, I argue that that document, it's an 11-page document, served as the playbook for what Lenin would employ in, 19, in 1917, if not 19 before. Lenin termed it revolutionary parliamentarism. That is, uh, the electoral parliamentary road, not as an end in itself, not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end. To treat the electoral parliamentary uh, arena as an end in itself is what Marx and Engels once referred to as parliamentary cretinism. <clears throat> parliamentary cretinism. To think that the electoral parliamentary road was the way to take power, was to suffer from parliamentary cretinism. And I've supplemented, I think it's original, I've supplemented parliamentary cretinism uh, with the term called voting fe fetishism. And voting fetishism is a mistaken belief that when you actually vote, you're actually exercising power. When you vote, what you're doing is registering a preference for something. Registering a preference is very important, it's very important, but it's not uh, exercising power. Power has to be taken. And even when we engage in mass protests and mass demonstrations, what we're doing is registering preferences. We're not exercising power. And what Lenin understood, drawing on the lessons of Marx and Engels, is that uh, the revolutionary path to power involves the actual taking of power. And at the same time, engaging in electoral and parliamentary activities can be an extremely important measure of when when to resort to armed struggle. That was the, one of the central lessons in Marx and Engels' document of 1850. And uh, Engels made, made it very clear in subsequent pronouncements and so on. And I claim that no one understood that argument better than, uh, better than Lenin. So when the opportunity arose in 1905, 1906, to engage in electoral parliamentary politics, Lenin jumped in at the occasion. And for the next 10 years, from 1905 to 1915, Lenin devoted a tremendous amount of time and energy to the electoral and the parliamentary process. Again, not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end, to decide when is the most propitious, when is the best time for the working class to actually, actually take power. So Lenin organized the parliamentary uh, uh, factions, fractions of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in the four Dumas, in the four state Dumas, between 1906 and, 19, and 1915, including organizing the Menshevik, the Menshevik deputies in those four, four state Dumas. And Lenin took elections seriously. Lenin couldn't get enough of elect, election returns. He had, a, he had a penchant for number crunching. Lenin loved to crunch numbers. And crunching those numbers, it gave him a sense about where's the strength of the revolutionary, of revolutionary forces, what are our opponents doing, and most important, to help educate, to lay out your ideas. Again, if you go back to the document, the 1850 address of Marx and Engels, you will see in, you will see in that 11-page uh, document uh, exactly what Lenin, Lenin would put into play. An important an important ingredient uh, in, that, in that strategy was independent working class political action. For Marx and Engels, that was the chief lesson, the chief lesson of the 1848-1850 revolutions, the European Spring. Only if the working class is organized independently, 
independently of the bourgeoisie, in the petty bourgeoisie, is it possible for the working class to take power? And this is, at, in many ways, at the heart of the debates between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, because the Mensheviks kept wanting to bend, kept wanting to bend to the petty bourgeoisie and the liberals. And Lenin, Lenin, Lenin wouldn't permit it, he wouldn't listen to it, he argued against it vociferously and so on, about the importance of independent working class political, political action. So when 1917, uh, February happened in 1917, the Bolsheviks argue, based upon that 10-year previous experience, were in the best position of all the currents of all the currents to take advantage of the new opportunities. And this is why Lenin, in one of his first uh, pronouncements and criticisms of the provisional government, he's, he's lambasting the provisional government in February, March of 1917 for not allowing elections. Lenin wants elections. He loves elections. He wants elections to take place because this is an opportunity for the working class to begin to assess its weight, its strength, and so on, to be able to test its ideas and, and to debate and compete with other, compete with other, uh, with other forces. And in October, by the time you get to October, on the basis of his elections, Lenin is making the case, based upon the elections to the Dumas and to the Soviets, not just the Soviets, but also to the Dumas, and looking at those elections, this is when Lenin calculates that this would be the best time to carry out, to carry out the armed struggle to overthrow the provisional, the provisional government. And for Lenin, we'll get in, we can get into this, uh, as, uh, as Fezzi mentioned, for Lenin, the best, the most, the best form of representative democracy is what was realized in the Soviets. The Soviets for Lenin were an extension, they were, they, were an exa they, were, they were another example of what had happened in the Paris Commune. For Lenin, the Paris Commune is crucial in understanding representative democracy and his understanding of, uh, what, uh, of what's involved. But Lenin is employing both the Dumas, both the Dumas and the Soviets to count, to count their forces. So on October the 25th, I argue that the uh, the overthrow of the provisional government is done relatively bloodless. It's relatively bloodless, exactly because the Bolsheviks have been able to calculate on the basis of elections to the Dumas and to the Soviets what their strength was. And most importantly, of course, is the Dumas, the Soviets, I'm sorry, the, the Soviets representing the uh, soldiers and the sailors. The soldiers and the sailors, Soviets, those were crucial. And for Lenin, the soldiers and the sailors were, were workers and peasants in uniform. And having an idea of what the soldiers and the sailors are thinking politically was crucial in understanding the relative ease in which the provisional government was overthrown in, uh, in October uh, 19, 1970. Lenin also, Lenin also paid attention to the Constituent Assembly. Contrary to the slanders about the Constituent Assembly, Lenin took the Constituent Assembly election seriously. He was one of the candidates. He was on the slate, the Bolshevik slate. He was very, very, and he took those elections so seriously that it became important when the election returns the electoral turns of the Constituent Assembly elections uh, finally became available at the end of 1918. Lenin pulled over the data, the election returns of the Constituent Assembly, to calculate the likely outcome of the Civil War. And he accurately predicted, accurately predicted uh, that the Soviet government would be victorious in the Civil War based upon the election returns, based upon the election returns to the uh, to the constituent, to the constituent uh, uh, assembly. There are other important insights that we haven't had a time to get into about the uh, uh, Lenin's uh, insight, uh, uh, 1901, his little article, which is a preview to what is to be done, in which he argues that in a revolutionary situation, if the working class is not organized, doesn't have its own political party, when a revolutionary explosion takes place, it's too late. It's too late to try to construct one. In the middle of a revolutionary explosion, if you haven't prepared ahead of time, it's too late to try to create a revolutionary party in the middle, 
in the middle of a revolutionary, revolutionary uh, upsurge. Uh, Lenin's final pronouncement on the use of uh, the electoral and parliamentary arena for revolutionary purposes. And this is when he comes up with the term revolutionary parliamentarism. He's trying to distinguish. He's trying to distinguish that from what later what will social democracy, uh, 20th century, 21st century social democracy would uh, would uh, uh, would understand uh, those activities uh, uh, to be. His left wing, left wing communism. That's, if you haven't read it recently, go back and read left-wing communism. He's trying to make a case. He's trying to make an appeal to parties in the West, in Western Europe and so on, to take the electoral parliamentary road seriously. Uh, but understand, it's not an end in itself, but it's a means to an end. By this time, he's, he's in critique with the, with the anarchists who argue that involvement in the electoral parliamentary arena is simply a dead, a dead end. Marx and Engels had already argued with the anarchists uh, on this particular issue, and Lenin uh, elaborates uh, on, these, on, on those arguments. One of the issues that Lenin had to deal with during the elections is the lesser evilism. He has fascinating writings on lesser, lesser evil politics. What happens when you got a real fascist-like party? Do you block with the liberals to prevent the fascist-like party from being elected? Uh, fascinating, fascinating discussions on the problem of lesser evilism. I mention this because this is one of the big problems that working class parties face in the world today. Uh, I know certainly in the United States, the case I know better, the problem of the Democratic Party uh, is, the lesser, is the lesser evil. This is one of the conundrums, the constant conundrums for the progressive forces uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the United States. All right. Uh, I'm getting close to the end of my time, and so I want to end here and simply repeat that I think the lessons of what the Bolsheviks did in 1917 are as relevant today, if not more so, especially for those of us where we have opportunities, what didn't exist oftentimes in third world countries, where we have opportunities to employ the electoral revolutionary arena, but to understand it not as an end in itself, not as an end in itself, as modern day social democracy tends to do, but as a means, as a means to an end. I'll let you. Thank you, August. Um, so now we'll hear from Tamas Kraus. Tamas is a professor in the Department of East European Studies in the Faculty of, Humani of Humanities at Eutbos Lorand University in Budapest. I hope I've got that right. Um, he's one of the editors of a Hungarian quarterly journal of social critique and culture called Esmalet, and he's written a number of books on Bolshevism, The National Question, Stalin, Lenin, and Lukács. And his book, Reconstructing Lenin, an intellectual biography, won the Deutsche Memorial the, the Isaac Deutscher Memorial Prize um, in 2015. Um, and I should say, so he'll read his paper, but um, Mihai is here as well to, to translate uh, for the questions afterwards. <coughs> you will understand that I need some help from my uh, friend because my English is a very special type of English language. I call it, <laughs> I call it Hanglish, Hungarian English. But uh, I hope you will understand me. That's why I, I have to, I never read my lectures, but uh, because of my English, I have to read. Sorry for that, but I have to read my paper. I choose a, a little bit funny title, uh, Some Messages from Eastern Europe on the occasion of the uh, century of the Russia Revolution, on the occasion of the Centenary. Cent centenary of the Russian Revolution. Um, but you, I think that you will understand me, because last time in November you understood. <laughs> 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 so I'm an opt optimistic man. Uh, <clears throat> The October Socialist uh, Revolution gives the new power elites the willies in today's Eastern Europe, including the post-Soviet states from Moscow to Budapest and so on. 
Basically, there are some reasons why this historic event is either discredited or hold back in our region in Eastern Europe, including uh, uh, Russia. <coughs> All these villages follow from the intention to prevent people wanting to find an alternative to the existing system. We have to know that the new power elite which expropriated for themselves the accumulated state property that according to the constitution, old state socialist constitution, belonged to the generations born after the revolution, wants people to forget even the memory of the Russian revolution. The memory of the October revolution drives us to undo everything. First of all, to reverse privatization of 89 change of regime. You remember that, what is it? What is it? That is why the revolution is not celebrated in Russia instead uh, any longer. Instead, it is discredited by every possible means and is narrowed down to two narratives to the terrain of violence and or utopy. Uh, the liberals and the nationalists exactly know that the October Revolution means a new type of organizational model of society where uh, power is taken away from the capital and bureaucracy and shifted to self-organizing self communities of, uh, the, of, the, of, of working people, both at the workplaces and in places of living. Uh, they do not need either capitalists, either bureaucrats any longer. Uh, I thought it even in the 70s and 80s that this fact is decided forever. I don't uh, deny it. The anti-capitalist nature of the revolution here shows itself the most apparently because this new model throws away and destroys capitalist private property and production relations. It comes to light that the question of property is a question of power politics, of power, the question of economy, the question of social organization of society at the same time. Uh, the October Revolution inherited, accomplished Marx's words. The knell of capitalist private property sounds, the expropriators are expropriated. This is the main message of the Russian Revolution. Lest we forget about its experiences. No wonder that the ruling classes in Eastern Europe are threatened even by the memory of the revolution. But uh, we, don't, we don't forget by the, that by the end of the 1920s, it became clear even in the wider social strata, that the socialist revolution of October, as Trotsky said, had frozen. This was widely documented in the contemporary literature at that time. I just refer here, for example, to the famous novel of Ilf and Petrov entitled The Twelve Chairs. I think that everybody can read it in English. According to different interpretations, the Soviet Revolution was tamed, or the Soviet Revolution became savage, or the revolution it degenerated, or simply transformed into a modernizing revolution, or the revolution transformed bureaucratic counter-revolution. The different definitions indicate different convictions, theories, and concepts. You should know it. For example, 
uh, in, Lenin's, in Lenin's epoch, Nikolai Ustralov, the former propaganda chief of White Admiral Kolchak, was the first after the defeat, uh, after the defeat of Kolchak who glorified Lenin as the hero of the Russian modernizing revolution and argued that he needs to be placed to the pantheon of the Russian national heroes, heroes because he led Russia from the Middle Ages to the New Age. According to this, Lenin simultaneously embodies Peter the Great, Napoleon, Mirabeau, Danton, Pugachev, and Robespierre together. <laughs> In spite of all his admiration and praises, Ustrialov is, however, silent on the most important and historical, historically most original part of the legacy of Lenin and the October Revolution, its socialist character. He writes, as if he were the true master of the typical historians and ideologists of the contemporary age, who in the best case consider the aims of October to be utopian, or in the worst case, to compare Nazism with communism as if they were two forms of evil in modern history. No American English ideologist, you know, all the time deals with, deal with this uh, ideological <coughs> falsification. And our Hungarian ideologists also. And Russians. The most significant and lasting evidence of the historical, of the historical survival of the socialist character of October is the Soviet humanist culture, which never broke with the revolution. This aspect of human development is particularly important for the international left because this was the starting point of its criticism of the deformed structure, deformed structures, the generated structures of Soviet development, the gulag and the bureaucratic autocracy. First and foremost, the Russian Revolution realized the formerly in quotation marks, utopian aspirations and ambitions of the lower social strata in many places of the world. The abolishment of uh, illiteracy, unemployment, the extreme social inequalities, the introduction of free education and health care, the, the emancipation of women and uh, minorities, etc. For example, you know that the women had uh, election rights uh, in uh, Soviet Russia uh, after October Revolution, the second day, and uh, homosexuals were free. Uh, Lenin colleague of, uh, in the first Soviet government, Chicherin, the, uh, uh, today we can say it, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Commissar of Foreign Affairs, he was a homosexual that uh, wasn't a problem in the Soviet government and in the first uh, uh, period of the Soviet development. I think that this is also very important even today. So, for a historical moment, millions of people believed that they are capable of creating a more human civilization which is open to the realization of a society without oppression, with social self-government and the liberation of wage labor, open uh, to production without capitalists. Summarizing, the humanist fundamental values of the revolution, social freedom, social equality, cooperative communal economy, grasp people's fantasy and soul at any place of the world. The October Revolution as a historical experience and memory, as the methodology of the communal transformation of the world, <coughs> survived the failure of state socialism as a practical experiment. On the other hand, the October Revolution had 
an enormous universal impact by giving fresh impetus to the national liberating movement and the anti-colonial anti struggle even until today. This uh, influence originated in also in the triumph of over Nazi Germany. All this, however, cannot divert our attention from the great dilemmas of the post-revolutionary era, which Lenin, after Kluczewski, summarized in the following. Even Peter the Great drove barbarism out of Russia through barbaric means. The question which has been left to the present age is the following. Is it possible to drive out barbarism through non-barbaric means? I cannot offer an, an answer, but I'm convinced that the objective reasons and conditions of a new revolution albeit in different forms and staged, stages, can be found in many regions of the world system. And this is not an unconditionally optimistic conclusion. We have to put the question, namely, what is the greater utopia? To believe in the improvement of global capitalism or the ability of human civilization to surpass it. And at the end, I would like to uh, say two words on uh, Lenin's heritage today, if you can follow my English. You understand? Great. Uh, uh, two words. The basic awareness uh, that grew more determined in the course of Lenin's political practice was that, no, it happens it very often. It's no, no, it's a no problem. It's not deliberate. Every day, it's no problem. <laughs> uh, so, uh, not really, <laughs> even, I mean. The basic evidence that grew more determined in the course of Lenin's political practice was that the social revolution and the transition to communism was becoming concretely possible. Because of this, Lenin's political heritage as a historical variant of Marxism is unique and unrepeatable. On the other hand, the original experience of revolutionary theory and action, its methodology played an undeniable colossal role in the history of the 20th century. In our, in our own time, under less than promising circumstances, there are attempts to refurbish Lenin's Marxism for the anti-globalist movement. The main reason for this is that the Russian revolutionary tradition of Marxism is the only one that offer, offered, for a time at least, an alternative to capitalism. It alone made a breach in the walls of capitalism, even if today that bridge seems to have been mended. The world situation in the last two decades demonstrates that the global dominance of capital has in engendered new forms of resistance. These didn't write off Marxism as a theory and a movement. Indeed, they could not and instead, in their search for alternatives, they keep running into Lenin's Marxism every step of the way. Thus, if we talk of Marxism, the stakes are higher than we may think for this heritage. This is the primacy of Lenin's Marxism is not a thing of the past. Slavoj Žižek has summarized the problem on Marxist footing. To repeat Lenin doesn't mean that we must repeat what he achieved, but rather what he was not able to achieve. By now, every serious sociologist and politician, he wrote, even Václav Havel admits 
as is acknowledged, that bourgeois democracy has exhausted its own resources, that it is incapable of resolving the world's basic problems. But if Leninist makes this claim, then he is immediately accused of totalitarianism. Lenin's topicality resides in that he transformed his own historical experiences into a set of theoretical concepts which undermines and destroys any justification of bourgeois society. And in spite of the contradictions involved, provides a tool for those who still think in terms of the possibility of another more human world. Thank you for that. Well, everyone's very good with timing. Um, okay, so uh, last we'll have Tarek. Tarek Ali has been a leading figure on the international left since the 1960s. He was central to the student movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement uh, at the time, and he's written extensively on world history and politics. His, his uh, works include The Obama Syndrome, The Clash of Fundamentalisms, and The Extreme Center, all published by Verso, and his forthcoming book, which uh, you can get leaflets for um, on your way out if you haven't already, is uh, The Dilemmas of Lenin, Terrorism, War, Empire, Love, Revolution. And I think it'll be coming out in May uh, this year. His contributions encompass film and theater scripts, novels, uh, and published conversations. For many years, um, he's been an editor of New Left Review, and he's also a regular contributor to uh, national media outlets and various um, magazines and newspapers. So, Tarek. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I'm not going to repeat what my uh, colleagues have said, because it's pointless. I, I agree in general. Uh, with what uh, Tom I said uh, about Lenin. What I want to talk about is the impact of the Russian Revolution on the 20th century world. Because we can, uh, you know, discuss uh, many times what happened to the revolution, uh, all the horrible things that were done in the 30s, etc., etc. But <clears throat> it's more interesting. We know all that, and that is the only thing that is effectively written about these days. But the impact, the, the, the most important thing about the Russian Revolution that needs to be understood uh, is this. Of all the major revolutions that took place over the last centuries in European or Euro-Atlantic history, if one counts the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution was the last and probably the most important, even though it's disappeared from course lists or is discussed in a very cavalier way. It's not people are not encouraged to read or write about it, uh, etc. This is why I feel that even writing about the Russian Revolution not to mention Lenin, is in today's world an act of resistance, intellectual resistance uh, to a society where memory is constant, historical memory is constantly under attack. One brief point about the Russian Revolution. What differentiates it from the previous two big revolutions in European history, the English and the French revolutions, is that these revolutions were not accidental, but were revolutions that probably would have taken place sooner or later at some stage, regardless of the characters involved. The point I'm making is that Danton, um, Robespierre, and the person who inherited this mantle in uniform, uh, Napoleon, would have found other people to take their places. The same is probably true of the English Revolution. I mean, Cromwell was, after all, planning, fed up, disgusted with the state of things in this country. He was planning to settle in New England, uh, to retreat, to go leave this country alone and uh, take his family there. In other words, become a migrant, if not a refugee. Uh, Napoleon was thinking seriously 
it, just prior to the outbreak of the revolution, of going and seeking service in the Tsarist Imperial Army. That's where he thought he would be able to play a good role, which he probably would have been able to, since he would not have confronted that army in the future. Uh, the Russian Revolution is a conscious revolution. It is made by people who have determined when, that this is the way they want to go. And in, it's in this that Lenin plays an absolutely key role. I mean, the role of individuals in history is hotly debated amongst liberals, Marxists, conservatives alike. It's an interesting subject. And I would say that without Lenin's presence, there would have been no socialist revolution in Russia. There would have been a revolution of sorts. Whether that revolution would have lasted, we don't know, or for how long. Because one of the things that has to be answered, I think, very strongly today, is the impression given by the dominant ideology that had this Bolshevik monstrosity not existed, the movement after February 1917 would have slowly created in Russia a democratic state, leaving aside the fact that, technically speaking, there were no democratic states in the world at the time. Uh, Britain, France, etc., were hardly democratic since half the population women were denied the right to vote. So it was a very truncated democracy even then. But leaving that aside, the notion that this would have gently flowed into the river of democracy, etc., doesn't make sense if you understand what the situation in Russia was. The two alternatives that emerged in late 1917, especially after September, was not Lenin or some abstract form of democracy. It was Lenin or military dictatorship led by Kornilov, Kolchak, Deneken, backed by the Entente powers, and designed to throw everything back. And had that happened, you probably would have seen a Judeo side in that Russia before you observed it in Germany. Because anti-Semitism was rife, the Black Hundreds were organized from the Tsarist Palace, organized by generals, organized by many of those who later participated in the Civil War. So this is a notion that needs really to be uh, 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 dealt with and done away with, that had they not taken power, the alternative would somehow have been incredibly pleasant and glittering. That is, anyone who's read Russian history, and serious conservative historians actually acknowledge this. Uh, that is not the case. It would not have, uh, it would not have happened. So this revolution, the second aspect of it, is carried through as the first of a chain of revolutions that are going to completely transform Europe. They write, all the uh, Bolsheviks, left Mensheviks are convinced that Russia on its own cannot push through everything that needs to be pushed through in order to make the transition to socialism. For that, they need one or two other big European countries, in particular Germany. Ge the German Revolution is what the Bolshevik leadership is backing on. And when that revolution doesn't take place, for contingent reasons, there's a debate too on that. Why didn't it happen? And there are a variety of reasons. But one reason it didn't take place is because the rulers of Germany and the rulers of Europe and the rulers of the United States were only too aware of what was likely to happen if the war wasn't quickly brought to an end and the local left in Germany uh, was not crushed. That was partially their response to the Russian Revolution. So they made sure that that happened. And the same people, in many cases, who carried out the executions of Rome, assassinations of Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, were the ones who participated in and promoted the triumph of fascism in Germany. So these things are related. 
and we can't separate one from the other. Despite all the horrors that happened after the Russian Revolution, some things were preserved. And one of those things, as Tamash has pointed out, was in however neutered, truncated form, the Red Army, which effectively destroyed the backbone of the Third Reich during the Second World War. The two key battles, Kursk and Stalingrad, were won by this army, after which it was impossible for the Germans' uh, uh, fascism to rise again. This, too, is virtually ignored now. You know, it was Private Ryan's war. It, the Russians uh, didn't play a big role in it at all. I mean, if you ask people why did we win the war, uh, all sorts of reasons will be given. That's the uh, <clears throat> thing worth understanding. The third thing, and the most important, of course, is that the impact of this revolution was not simply in Europe. The Russian Revolution created a new wave of nationalist revolutionaries, communist revolutionaries all over the world, primarily in China and in India and throughout South America. The candidate for the left in the Ecuadorian presidential elections, who won the first round of the elections last week, his name, in case you didn't know, is Lenin Moreno. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, I hope he wins the second round, too, in a few weeks' time. But in any case, so the impact of this revolution was very deep and very profound. And the Chinese Revolution was, of course, very different from the Russian Revolution in the sense that forced by defeat, history, Japanese invasion, the Chinese revolutionaries had to go into the countryside and build their army there and fight a long war based on the peasants, which got them peasant support almost from that time onwards, from the late 20s onwards, and they took the cities with popular support, but with the support also of an overwhelming majority of the population. The Russian Revolution was essentially an urban affair. The peasants were very recalcitrant, sympathetic to semi-anarchist, <coughs> right-wing anarchist groups like the old social revolutionaries, but what radicalized the peasants was the First World War. They were the troops, they were the soldiers. And as they saw what was happening to them, to their families at home, famines, uh, usage as cannon fodder, the combination of Bolshevik agitation and the peasants who, in uniform who were feeling the same thing on the battlefields did it. I think the imperialist war, the First World War, fought by the different imperial powers, broke up the Tsarist state, as it broke up for other empires, by the way. But it provided such a savage blow against the Tsarist state that there, there was no way a determined political party was not going to win. And it's the combination of these events that made the Russian Revolution, and it's the staying power of the state created by their revolution, despite all the criticisms one can make of it, that made it possible for the revolutions in Asia, the Chinese Revolution, the Vietnamese Revolution, subsequently in South America, the Cuban Revolution, the last of the revolutions that developed as a result of, in a long term, of the uh, Russian Revolution, and in the Second World War, the Yugoslav Revolution, the only revolution which took place. There could have been one in Greece as well, but it was vetoed and sabotaged. And I don't mention the immediate wave of revolutions which happened in Europe, you know, with uprisings in Budapest, a seizure of power by uh, uh, Bela Kun, uh, by the Munich uprising, by the uprising in Berlin, etc., etc. Internationally, the Russian Revolution was responsible 
for the victories in China, for the victories in Vietnam. And this is not simply on the level of demagogy. Even when the advice being given by Moscow to the Chinese leadership or the Vietnamese leadership was totally wrong, those leaders had enough power and enough independence not to reply and fight with Russia openly, but to do what they considered had to be done. They were not dogmatic in that sense. And of course, the Cubans likewise. I mean, they only came to socialism after the revolution and were kept going, you know, as we know, with the, the support of the post-Soviet state. I mean, of the Soviet state. That's what uh, uh, kept those revolutions going. So the 20th century was Lenin's century. It was the century of the Russian Revolution. And uh, there's no point in denying it. It's now history. Just like, even though it's closer to us, it is history now. And we study it, or we should study it like we study, though we don't enough, the English Revolution or the French Revolution. It's part of that great wave of revolutions that took place. And if you even compare <clears throat> what happened after the defeats of these other revolutions, I mean, we know perfectly well what happened. That after the restoration and later, Britain became the, the, the sort of stronghold of reaction, determined to crush any upheaval that was taking place in Europe. After the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815, the Congress in Vienna, the Congress of Victors, said the one thing that will never happen in Europe again is another revolution. And yet, 1848, there were revolutions. In 1871, there was the Paris Commune. In 1905, there was the first Russian Revolution. In 1917, there were two Russian revolutions. So it didn't quite work out like that. Now, by saying this, I'm not arguing or saying that we are going to have repeats of these revolutions. No revolution repeats another. They are all different in character for a variety of reasons. They have some things in common. They have their radical phases. They have their counter-radical phases. But they don't stop. And revolutions are what makes history move forwards. And even when it moves backward, it can't move or it doesn't move as backward as it was prior to the revolution. The last attempt to do this, of course, is in our lifetimes. That from the 90s <clears throat> to now, euphoric the, over the fact that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist, or that the Chinese had embraced the capitalist road, everything that had been accepted by the social democratic parties with the approval largely of the capitalist classes that dominated was that in order to keep the revolution at bay, you have to make reforms. You create your health services that offer free health. You give free education to people. You, you make all these things free so that people feel, well, what's the need for a revolution? And whereas in the, the Soviet Union, after Khrushchev, and in much of Eastern Europe, you had a system of what I call social dictatorships, political dictatorships, with a social base that was effectively uh, social uh, in terms of uh, subsidized uh, necessities on every level, which people in Eastern Europe miss today. There's no doubt about it. So. After the collapse of all that, they said, we can do what we want to do. And it was very interesting. Um, just after the Wall Street crash of 2008, their big discussion, what are we going to do? They didn't go back. They refused to go back. 
They refuse to even agree to a tiny bit of social democracy. And I think an American economist, Robert Reich, who was in Clinton's government, I saw him being interviewed in 2008 in the United States. And he said, he was asked, and he said, well, the reason we don't need to do anything, or he said the reason they don't need to do anything is very simple. There's no alternative. We had to in the 30s because there was Russia. We had to. Now there's no alternative. We can do we, what we want and we get away with it. So privatizations and the way in which society is run today on every level virtually are a result of the fact that there is no alternative, even a bad alternative, an anti-capitalist alternative. So they feel they can get away with murder. And the people who have, who have challenged them are, of course, the social movements with varying degrees of successes. And the people who've challenged them more effectively are the right the reactionary, semi-populist, right-wing forces mobilized by politicians of the right and extreme right, which have given us Trump in the United States, making very exaggerated promises to his people, which he will not be able to fulfill. And we'll see what happens then. And we are now watching <clears throat> from across the channel what is going on in France with the mainstream center parties collapsing around their ears. Holland for weeks was on 4%. I mean, these rogues in this country attack Corbyn for being on whatever percent he is. They don't look at what their own politicians are on who've created this situation. And this is why, in some ways, the debates in the Russian Revolution the aphorisms of Lenin, one in particular comes to mind. Politics is concentrated economics. How can we argue against that? I mean, you look at it all around. That is what politics is, which is why democracy itself is under attack, because all the parties offer, or mainstream parties, offer the same thing. The right basically offers the same thing, but they add to it some populist demands like helping the poor, creating a new infrastructure. Uh, Marine Le Pen says we're not going to, far from more privatizations, we're going to take back what should be the heritage of the French people, which is nationalized industry, state control of this, that, and the other. She says that. And yet in all the constituencies which the Le Pen has won, the local, the mayor's elections and the cities, they've canceled free milk. So, you know, it's very interesting, the rhetoric they're using and what they'll be able to deliver. And if they don't deliver anything, there will be mayhem, both in the US and in parts of Europe where the far right uh, is growing, not to mention this country with uh, its current government. So it's this crisis, because while communism may have disappeared, or what was called communism, or the Soviet Union, or all that world, the world is still in a state of acute crisis. Capitalism hasn't disappeared. And the arguments that were developed by the Bolshevik leaders and theoreticians, Lenin primarily, but Trotsky, Bukharin, against capitalism still hold. But the changes taking place in the social structures and the sociology of the Western world are such that other means, means related more to the needs of the day to day, bearing in mind what has happened to the world uh, will be required in order to defeat capitalism. It is no good having a political anti-capitalism. That is what we have on offer. I say this, you know, with I support all these movements and demonstrations and resistance. But to have a 
a political anti-capitalist movement is a contradiction in terms. So at some stage, at some level, we will need political instruments. We will need political parties of a new type. And as long as that remains true, and that will remain true as long as capitalism exists, then Lenin's insistence on the primacy of politics on the primacy of the political, that you fight people ultimately by challenging their ideas, and not simply by actions, but through ideas, will remain a necessity for our world. Thank you. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, so we'll uh, open up the floor to questions. Um, don't feel like you have to make a long, drawn-out contribution. You can ask a very simple question, what you might think is a very basic question. Um, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, take a few of them and then get our panelists to respond. OK, so let's take this gentleman in the front here, and then you. Uh, I'm Rana, and I'm a student at UCL, and my question is for Tariq Saab. Uh, my question is for Tariq Saab, and uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask uh, about the, you compare the Russian Revolution to what happened, and then compare it to what happened in India later on. So if, if you were referring to the anti-colonial movement, don't you think that that was strictly or largely elitist? in character, or if you were talking about the movements of Indira Gandhi and Bhutto Saab, then weren't they just populist movements and nothing more? Thanks. Repeat the question. Sorry, can, can you repeat succinctly the question? Um, I wanted to ask, you compare the, what happened in Russia and then what happened in India later on. So just to clarify, what were you referring to? Um, I'm, I'm tr honestly, I'm, yeah. We'll, we'll just take a few and then. Yeah, yeah but I, I, I would like to get the question, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, um, you know, um, what happened in Russia after the revolution in Russia? Yes, that's what you want to know, yeah. Okay. So there's a woman at the back there. Did I see a hand? A woman's hand? No? Okay, there. Uh, that, that, the man in the blue. Sweater. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, thank you very much. It was really interesting. And I have a couple of questions for the panel. So uh, the first one is uh, regarding the role of violence is seen as force to bring about the alternative society. Could you uh, speak into the mic? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, because, like, uh, as Engels and uh, Marx uh, uh, wrote, uh, well, Engels uh, in particular, violence, well, force is the midwife of, uh, of every old society pregnant with a new one. And so I want to know your opinion about the role of force uh, in bringing about the alternative society, so the alternative to capitalist society. And then the second one is... Um, to what extent is possible and conceivable um, to undertake the way towards this new society by a single actor, by a single actor, a single individual or actor like in the international system, for instance? Uh, and uh, if not, is it needed a block of actors to work together to make this possible? Thank you. Thanks. Um, this gentleman over there, just, just there, behind you, Kieran. There, yeah. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel. First of all, thank you very much uh, for the talk. It was great. Um, I wanted to ask the panel. Uh, Tariq Ali spoke about um, the world being in crisis right now, especially with the Trump phenomena, etc. What? were you hoping for slash thinking um how would you how would you assume any counter not revolution but anything that happens as a result of this any left um pressure any reactionary um circumstance or occasion how do you think it'll 
come about and what do you think needs to be done? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, yep. Okay. First of all, uh, <clears throat> my name is Aman Khan. I congratulate you that you have such a learned scholarly speaker and uh, a comrade known worldwide for his revolutionary ideas. What I want to ask him, he knows a lot, and he has spoken very well, that uh, does he foresee a kind of a tidal wave of a world revolution? And if he really foresees or sees it, how long does it take? Uh, uh, what does he think, how long will it take? How many countries will come under revolutionary sway, you know, because the aggression of imperialism and other powers are also becoming very, very aggressive and more aggressive, you know. Okay, thanks. And the woman beside him, yep. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, could I just ask if you have any thoughts about Lenin's writings in the work of Ali Shariati and the Iranian Revolution and your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you uh, for the presentations, uh, the speeches. Um, and the que my question is, I'm here. My question is basically on the question of modernization and um, economic production, productivity. Um, I was reading a couple of days ago Lenin's writing on the move towards the higher stage of communism. And it was basically the whole prom not the, prom the whole project is based on the requirement of having such a high pro productivity you know, economically that uh, the withering away of the state is possible, that the um, um, disconnection, between, disconnection between the manual and intellectual labor is in the end um, abolished and all that. So there is a lot of emphasis and a lot of importance for economic productivity. Um, now that people are among, around the world are thinking from the left side <coughs> uh, how to be critical about capitalism and capitalist development, how can we, what kind of alternative can the left think of in terms of not emphasizing on productivity and all the de degradation of society and the environment that, it, that comes with it, at the same time having an, a project based on increasing productivity in order to emancipate and liberate society. So uh, this is a, a, a dilemma that, uh, you know, eco-feminists or um, anarchists uh, always have like uh, as, as a first question for Socialist revolutionaries, and I want to know, know your uh, opinions about it. Should we start? Should we start with answering the yeah. Whatever you would like to answer. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. I fully understood all of the uh, all of the questions, uh, but there was one about what happened after. I think there was a, a couple of questions related to what happened after 1917. Uh, I subscribe to the view, uh, basically, Leon, Leon Trotsky's analysis uh, that uh, a counter-revolution uh, eventually took place uh, in the Soviet Union that became increasingly visible by the end of the 1920s. And what that counter-revolution consisted of was the usurpation of political power, which had briefly been in the hands of workers and peasants, uh, the usurpation of that power by the bureaucracy. And in fact, Lenin's last pronouncement, uh, shortly before his final incapacitating stroke, his characterization of the uh, Soviet Union was a, was a, uh, a bureaucratically uh, distorted worker state. Uh, Lenin never, Lenin never called the Soviet Union socialist. He never called it a socialist society. And he was simply following the lead of Marx and Engels, who always, who also understood that in order for a socialist outcome to take place in the Soviet Union, the Russian Revolution would have to move westward. It would have to move to a major capitalist power, and Germany was the, was the likely place that could happen. Indeed, as, uh, as we we were discussing, as Tark mentioned earlier, Germany came uh, close to three times having a socialist revolution. And the defeat, in my opinion, the defeat of that, those efforts uh, paved the way for the fascist, for the fascist solution. So the, 
uh, outcome of the Soviet Union was a counter-revolution. Political power had briefly been in the hands of workers and peasants. Uh, the bureaucracy had usurped it, and that's what was in place. It was a uh, Stalin's, Stalin's bureaucratic uh, caste, and it had, impl it had international implications. If we have time, we can talk about uh, the common turn, what happened uh, within the Communist International. Uh, that would have, in my opinion, negative features eventually for many of the aspiring revolutionaries in other, in other countries in the, thir in the third world. Thanks, Elvis. Um, Tomas? I, I can react on some questions. I asked a lot of words of, uh, <laughs> from uh, Mihai, and I, uh, and I think that I can uh, say something uh, may be interesting on the different questions. Uh, I tried to answer on the different questions together. Um, starting point <clears throat> of Lenin and the, and the Russian Marxists, and not only uh, Bolsheviks, but Mensheviks before 1917, that um, any kind of a revolution in Russia, even men Marxist Mensheviks also seeing, thought, that revolution uh, can be anti-capitalist, nothing else. This is the uh, specific, uh, this came out of the specific historical um, situation of Russia. This revolution can be repeated even today, tomorrow, any time in Russia, only uh, we need only one uh, very important uh, system of circumstances at the, um, the consciousness of the working class people. But who will follow the communists today after the collapse of state socialism? It's a very big question. How to organize people after this uh, failure? This is the question, and, uh, and nobody, nobody knows the answer because a uh, working class movement has to find out something. Big uh, political parties uh, and important political parties uh, do not exist without working class movement. <clears throat> Lenin was nothing before, as a political force before 1917, but they had an organization which could meet the, the, that time the biggest working class and peasant movements in the world. Uh, you cannot order or you cannot create a, re a revolution just because you desire it. Yeah. You understand that? Uh, oh, Nazakas in Russian. Order. On order. On order. Oh. You, 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 you cannot make revolution on order. To order. To order. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Galette. To order. <laughs> Without a working class movement, uh, uh, never uh, uh, won't be any kind of revolution. You see, I, I, I am against the mystification of the working class. The working class can support even fascist movements. You see, we know the German history. It depends on us that this working class movement, uh, which kind of direction uh, we choose. In Hungary, for example, today. The far right is right is fascist in the parliament 85%. You know? This is a fact, and, 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 and we have to think about that. And another one, the community as a starting point of Lenin against capitalism. You see, I admired uh, the movement. I, on Saturday, I, I spoke about that. Uh, occupying movement in New York, seven million pe people uh, in Italy uh, under Berlusconi many years, etc., etc. The capital is not afraid of this kind of occupying. They, they are not afraid of occupying of streets and squares, etc. This is a very good thing for the media, very big business, television, all the time. Lenin knew 
that the capital uh, is uh, afraid of one thing, when the Soviets, when the workers' councils occupy the workplaces. This is the only thing. In Italy, as a historian, I can say it. See, uh, Spain, uh, Spain, 36, 37, 38, Russia, 97, Hungary, 1919, 56, etc. Italy, 20, uh, 19, 20, 21, before Mussolini. Uh, why came Mussolini? Because of the uh, workers' councils, etc. And after that, workers control the workplaces, you can occupy the different things. Because the working class and the people has adequate organizations. This is most, imp uh, most important. In theory, at, at Marx and Lenin, uh, socialism's theory of Marx and Lenin, uh, the party doesn't exist as a term. In socialism, no party, no any kind of bureaucratic apparatus, only before. Why found out the American politology, the uh, at last sentence, that we lived 40 years in Eastern Europe in communism? Even Kad Janusz Kada never spoke about that. He said that we tried to construct socialism. Even Brezhnev, uh, Brezhnev he was not a, a, a clever guy. Uh, Suslov, he uh, either. <laughs> But he was the main ideologist. Never spoke. They found out, instead of communism, uh, developed socialism. You see, because they knew that this is not a communism. Why they found out this word? To discredit everything. That's all. They wanted uh, politologists and, uh, and our finance people by the regime, by the system, to discredit everything but is leftist, socialist, etc. The October Revolution. Okay. Eric? <clears throat> yeah. Um, it, after the Second World War <clears throat> and the changes brought about it, there was a, a reformist wave in the Eastern European countries and inside the Soviet Union itself. It was, after all, the 20th Party Congress and Khrushchev's speech denouncing the crimes of Stalin and opening up the Gulag, releasing political prisoners, which created a new situation inside the Soviet Union as, uh, itself as well. Uh, and it triggered off the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, where people said, fine, well, we accept all that, uh, and we want a different a uh, form of government, and they were arguing in 1956, I mean, there was a Soviet in Budapest, as you know, Tamas, and uh, uh, basically they were arguing for democratic rights. That is what they argued for, as they did in Czechoslovakia in 1968. And Lenin, in one of his last writings, was very, very sharp. He said, uh, we didn't know everything. Very sharply. We thought we knew everything. We didn't know everything. We've made numerous mistakes and serious mistakes. And the state, he said, the wretched, despicable czarist state bureaucracy that we wanted to destroy, not only have we not been able to destroy it, but this bureaucracy is proving attractive to segments of the Bolshevik party itself. That's what he wrote. And he said, in order to start again, we have to renew, constantly renew the revolution. The people who came after Stalin's death, you know, Khrushchev, Gorbachev, I mean, Khrushchev was not stupid, but he, he didn't have the guts or the power <clears throat> to renew the revolution. That would have meant an upheaval, and Gorbachev renewed it, unfortunately, in the wrong way by handing it over to global capitalism, thinking they'd give him a few crumbs. So there were possibilities which uh, uh, were not taken advantage of. And the uh, Russian workers, the Soviet workers, 
didn't feel they had a stake in this regime anymore. They didn't come out. There were no huge mobilizations on demonstrations for either side. It's not the case that there were big demonstrations in Russia saying, yes, we want to be ruled by oligarchs. No, that didn't happen. But nor were there big mobilizations saying, we want the other, because people could see the other had failed to offer. The bureaucracy had imploded, bankrupt, no ideas left. And many of them, as Trotsky forecast in a book in the 1930s, became oligarchs and bureaucrats, former heads of the uh, Young Communist League, uh, you know, buying up properties, in, not just in Moscow, but in London. So, <clears throat> Uh, that we can't avoid. It's happened. There's no good in thinking that anything can be right. What, I mean, one of the things Lenin always used to argue was that recognize reality. Don't make up things. If you suffered a defeat, say it's a defeat. And how to pull out of that defeat. And that is the phase we are in. It's a long, long transition to something we're not sure. Where is it a transition to? But I, I wouldn't, I mean, you know, I accept what you say about the Occupy movements and the street demonstrations. They are small things, but it's important they take place because from them, people of the Occupy movement try and see well, this isn't worked. It's not, they're not dumb. They try and see what might work. Bernie Sanders might work. So already after the Occupy movement, you had in the United States a mass movement of young people, but not exclusively young people, who accepted that they were socialists. But what they meant by that was social democrats. But that's a big step forward in the United States. And uh, they, they, they gathered round Sanders. And here one has to say, had Sanders an alternative vision to even create something outside the Democratic Party, it would have been a small step forward. That's what we, it's the transitions to other transitions. We saw a similar process here with uh, the Corbyn campaign, recruiting you know, up to half a million members of the Labour Party new young members. How long it lasts, we don't know. Probably as long as Corbyn lasts inside the Labour Party as its leader. But it, was, it showed a desire of people, young people, for something different. And that I don't think is going to go away. Of course, from there, the leap to revolution is huge. And, you know, as I, I, as I stressed when I first spoke, even the Russian Revolution itself, <clears throat> even the February Revolution, leave alone October, might not have happened had Russia not been in the First World War. It was that First World War which disintegrated and began to break up Russian society to create February. And then a continuation of that war which meant a huge surge of support for the Bolsheviks. And by the way, it was only when the Bolsheviks had a majority in the two largest elected Soviets in the country, Petrograd and Moscow, that they decided to make the bid for power. And at the same time, elections to the Constituent Assembly were taking place. And though the majority of the peasants voted for the social revolutionaries, giving them, I think, about 13 million votes. 10 million votes were cast, mainly in the cities for the Bolsheviks. Now, 10 million is not a coup d'etat. It is a huge, huge number of people. So this idea, it was a coup carried out by a hand. How can you do that? Had it been a coup, it wouldn't have worked, because two members of the Bolshevik Central Committee, opposed to the insurrection, had already published its debate. What impact did that have? Nil. Because society had disintegrated to such a large degree. They knew what the Bolsheviks were doing. They didn't hide it. They said it openly. We're going to make the revolution. 
They didn't give the date, but then two dissident members gave the date. That didn't have uh, any impact. Surveillance, both the Bolshevik and Menshevik Central Committees packed with Ukraina, Tsarist secret police agents. Some of them played a nasty role. Did that stop it? No, because when there is an elemental mass movement and upheaval, it's difficult to stop it because the counter-revolution is temporarily very weak, which is why there was hardly any violence in 1917 that came after. So this notion of this being anti-democratic is not the case. Without that support, they wouldn't have succeeded in, uh, <clears throat> in getting any further, and that is worth recognizing. And the huge tragedy, one of the things we haven't discussed, is what they did with Lenin after the, uh, his death was to make him into a Byzantine icon. He wasn't even read. I've spoken to you know, later members of the Soviet Central Committee. I said, did you ever read Lenin? No. <laughs> he was interpreted for us. Don't read him. So his books weren't read, his writings weren't read, where he says very concretely things which assault numerous things that were being done, especially on the national question and the right of the Georgians, the uh, right of other nationalities for, uh, for, for independence. Mm -hmm. He was very strong on that. His first big row was on this question. And one last point I'll make, which is, it's true they were banking on the European Revolution, absolutely true, which didn't happen. So what did they do? <coughs> Lenin was still alive when the German Revolution had failed. What did they do? Both, they, I, I, I just read a few months ago when I was working on my book, exchanges between Lenin and Trotsky on what? On India. And Trotsky, with nothing better to do on his civil war train, suddenly has this brainwave in the middle of the night where he thinks there are only 30,000 or so British troops in India occupying India. How many volunteers would we need to go and defeat them? <laughs> they actually considered sending a special Red Army battalion mm. to defeat and crush the British in India. I'm glad they didn't because it wouldn't have been so easy because it was not just the troops but a whole network of alliances the British had built. But they were thinking about that. They were discussing China and saying just because the European business has ended, that doesn't mean the rest of the world isn't there. We should concentrate on China and India. It's in their writings. So this notion of them being Eurocentric is nonsense. It was the least Eurocentric revolution in the world. And they wanted it to spread globally. Europe they wanted because of its economic development, which could be used not just for Russia, but for the world at large. I mean, that is the way they thought. That is how their minds worked. I mean, people may not like it, but they were rock-solid internationalists. And that's what we, we must remember about them and, uh, and celebrate. And I say this deliberately because sometimes <clears throat> I get very angry, especially in the United States. You know, we know what Trump is, extreme right-wing demagogue, et cetera, et cetera. But on some questions, he is continuing what other American presidents have done, Republicans and Democrats. And what angers me is that for many liberal citizens and people who went to Occupy, who over the eight years of the Obama administration didn't open their mouths, let Obama invade seven countries, let him drone virtually half the Muslim world, that's fine. Oh, it's not fine, but we won't think about it. But the minute this idiot comes and starts saying things, people get angry, and they should get angry. But it would have been more difficult for Trump to start doing this had he not inherited the war policies of Nixon, Reagan, the Clintons, Bush, and Obama, because mm. they had been doing that long before him. 
Turk. That's yeah. what's created the Can vacuum I... in which these people rise. Turk, we'll, we'll, uh, Thomas wanted to make a point, and, and August wanted to make a point as well, and then we'll take a couple more questions, and then um, we'll very, wrap up. Very shortly, uh, three small... Uh, Three small things. One uh, about the putsch, the revolution and putsch. Uh, the bourgeois historiography uh, writes uh, uh, about the Russian Revolution as a putsch all the time. This is a common place. Coup, uh, sorry, in English, coup. This putsch we say it in Hungarian and in Russian. Uh, summer of 1917. 10 million workers, peasants, and soldiers were organized in the Soviets. And the Bolshevik party membership was some thousand, maybe some 10,000 people, summer of 1917. And in October, 20 million people were organized in the Soviets on different levels. What kind of who is it? The second, uh, uh, this Art uh, Academy of Art in London, a very interesting uh, Soviet exhibition. But how uh, does the bourgeois propaganda work? The British imperialism is very interesting in, in, even in this place. They criticize. Uh, uh, descriptions under the pictures and uh, uh, placards, uh, posters, etc. That uh, revolutionaries made this kind of mistakes and that kind of mistakes and famine, they uh, have the, etc., uh, etc. Et All the idiotism. And any words about that the British German, French, American, etc., imperialism attacked the Soviet Russia. And they, uh, and somebody wrote something about the famine in Russia. Which was, uh, hypocrisy of yours here in, in England. It's, it's great. <laughs> That's great but more sophisticated than the, than the Hungarians. In, in Hungary, they lie 25 hours a day, they lie 20, 24, they lie 25. <laughs> uh, the third thing, the, uh, the Soviet Union and perspectives. Uh, about, uh, you spoke about the, the betrayal as a, as a term, maybe you are right, but, uh, but is not a betrayal, this is a class struggle, when the upper stratums of the Soviet society, upper, the party elite, decided to destroy the Soviet Union. Because they wanted their privileges uh, organized in, a, uh, in a, a new mode. On the new mode. To restore capitalism. Yeah. Uh, privatization, capitalism, the second, uh, the second issue of capitalism. That was the main. After that, uh, and you were absolutely right, that they constructed a new Russia, which is much worse than the old was. Seeing from, uh, looking at this development from below. Oh, I, I, I often in Russia. This is really a big capital, a capitalistic catastrophe. After that, to repeat, uh, and, and the left, left-wing organization, they want to improve capitalism. After that, that this new capitalism is worse than the old state socialism was. Uh, who believes in a new capitalist, I don't know what. This is not a leftist today, I think. This is something else, you know. No, no good capitalism. This is an idiotism, utopianism. This has no any sense. I can't say it because I'm nearly 70. No good capitalism. Genocidic capitalism exists everywhere. This is the world system. This is the core of the capitalism, I think. And after the collapse of the Soviet, the world became worse. More wars, more bloodshed, etc., etc. And I 
do not defend the old uh, communist elite. Do you understand me, uh, me I think? <laughs> um, okay, August. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly endorse uh, what uh, Tarek said about uh, uh, the Obama administration, which we should never, uh, never forget about. Uh, in the protests that have been taking place uh, since the Trump <clears throat> asked him to office, one of the things that uh, revolutionary forces uh, uh, have to do is, and then one, they need to go to these protests, need to talk to young people and so on, and to disabuse them, especially of uh, ideas about uh, uh, the Democratic Party, the lesser, the lesser evil Democratic Party, uh, to raise the question, well, if you're against Trump, what are you for? It's not enough to be Trump. What are you actually for? So it's important to be uh, at those discussions to remind them about, indeed, uh, the Obama administration's foreign policy, the drone attacks, the deportations. So Obama, at a certain moment in his administration, was known as the, the chief deporter of uh, Im immigrant workers. So what, what Trump is doing with these deportations of immigrant workers is a follow-up to what the Obama administration was doing. So this, the, the biggest problem we face in the United States politically on the left is the lesser, the lesser of two evils. The, that's the biggest problem that we've got to, uh, to help people overcome and to really think about what is, what's involved in a real working class, a working class alternative to business as usual. Um. Thanks, August. Um, OK, I see a question there. And there, and there, and there. OK, so we'll start with Alpa, and then over here. We'll just take those questions, I think, and then, and then, and then wrap up. So I don't want you shifting yeah. in your seats. <laughs> OK. Thanks very much. I thought it was a great panel. Um, I'd just like to ask Tarek Ali uh, uh, the question that I believe this young man in front of you was trying to ask earlier. What do you think is the legacy of um, Lenin in India? Uh, and I ask this because I think it's a very interesting question, given that uh, in India today, you know, there is an armed Marxist, Leninist, Maoist revolutionary struggle still going on that has consistently, despite all of its problems and all the problems within it, has been fighting uh, for its low castes, its Dalits and its Adivasis. Um, and that in May this year will have been burning in the country for 50 years. So, yeah, I'd just like, to, uh, like, okay. like you to address his question. Thanks. Thanks. So there's one up there. Oh, sorry. And then you. Sorry. Hi. Thank you. It was a really interesting talk. I, I would like to focus on uh, the thing that Tariq Ali said that uh, after the 90s and especially after the financial crisis, it became really obvious that there wasn't an alternative political idea. And uh, as Lenin said, you have to fight in the political arena and the sphere of ideas. And I agree that there wasn't a whole new vision that we had, like communism, for example, but we had little ideas, some, like uh, things that are now being uh, termed uh, identity politics, cultural appropriation, uh, pre the whole privilege discourse, and so on. And after the failings of uh, what is called in America the left, there is a widening debate about if working a working class alternative is compatible with identity politics, with the, this whole discourse. And I think this kind of debate is going to be even more present as time passes. And I'd like to think, I'd like to know what do you think about uh, these questions? What uh, are, com are these ideas compatible with uh, a working class alternative, or they are a hindrance at the last resort. Because I think, uh, especially in the American left context, that's going to be one of the most, uh, most important debates that's going to happen. Thank you. OK, thanks. 
Uh, and then the, the yep, that guy over there. Yep, and then and then over there. And that will be all. Thanks. This is also a question related to the final comment about the politics and the struggle of ideas. Could you say something? It's a question for all three of you. Could you say something about the importance of conflict within the Bolshevik party prior to the Russian Revolution to actually bring about unity within the party? Because I have a feeling that contemporary struggles were very often based on a unity that is about lowest common denominator. And we're very afraid to have conflict within the organizational processes, afraid of splits, afraid that that you know, if you criticize someone's ideas too much, you will break the unity. And actually, that results in a relativism, that basically all ideas are equally valid. And while everyone may have the right to say their ideas, the better ideas have to win themselves out over the less good ideas. And that's a political struggle in itself. And it seems we're very reluctant to engage in that in contemporary struggles. Thanks. And the final question over there. <clears throat> Behind you. Behind you, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, just a final point of what you said, I think, in the beginning. You know, you are all saying that, um, you know, obviously we, we criticize capitalism. I mean, we don't have much time now to go further into details. It's very unjust and unfair uh, model of, of growth. But, and, you know, we would like, you know, to further on our socialist ideas, as, you know, you uh, laid out. But, don't you think that actually, unfortunately, in this historical moment, you know, Trump, Brexit, um, the growth of China, um, capitalism is the uh, winning model, which is being exported in all over the world. And um, let's not forget the um, diktat from IMF and World Bank, the structural adjustments, say, on Greece or Puerto Rico, I think, as you uh, said in the beginning, these are things that ha are happening these days. And there is, though there is strict protests and so on and so forth, I don't think there's been a real alternative to it. So I believe, unfortunately, capitalism is still um, a force to deal with and it's not being defeated at all. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we'll go um, August, uh, Tamash, and Tarek. But can I just say two minutes each? <laughs> and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> the question of uh, internal debate and democracy within the Bolsheviks. I think the Bolsheviks were exemplary um, on this question. The uh, democratic centralism was alive and real within the Bolshevik, within the Bolshevik party. Uh, the Bolshevik... Uh, Party current, in my opinion, practiced more democracy than any other current uh, leading up to the Bolshevik re Revolution. And uh, Lenin oftentimes was on the minority positions <laughs> they, uh, on, um, on many questions. He was disciplined once <laughs> because of his views and so on. But there was a lively debate that took place uh, within the Bolshevik Party. And that continued after the revolution until the 10th Party Congress, that fateful decision to suspend tendencies and factions. That decision that was made in 1921. Trotsky said later, in hindsight, that decision to suspend uh, factions and tendencies paved the way for the Stalinist counter-revolution. Counter and Trotsky said he would still have voted the same way given the circumstances in which the Bolsheviks uh, found themselves in 19, 1921. So, uh, yes, this question of internal debate and democracy is extremely important. And I th it's related to the other question about common, about uh, yeah, India. And I want to relate to that by looking at common terms. One of the tragedies of Stalinization is that any political parties that came into existence that called themselves Marxist, Leninists, that affiliated with common turn after 1928 were miseducated about Leninist norms. Up until the Fourth Congress, there was internal debate in common turn in, uh, in, uh, between different sections and so on. Moscow didn't control anything. That would change after, 19, after 1928. And sadly, parties that came in, any party that came into common turn 
after that period of time was much more likely to, to be miseducated and when it comes to Lenin, what Leninist norms are. The only exception I know, and we don't have time to get into it in my opinion, is the Cuban, the Cuban case. And the reason why the Cubans is an exception is that Fidel Castro's current, the July 26th movement, it was formed in 1955 as an alternative to the Stalinist party in uh, Cuba. It was an alternative. That, in my opinion, is what, what explains the differences, what makes Cuba the exception. Okay, thanks. Uh, August, Thomas, very uh, briefly. I put everything. Uh, one sentence to, to, the, to this young, um, who asked about the contradictions in the leftist organizations. Uh, you know, the, the what kind of political discussions uh, uh, do you think? Because if in the main questions, uh, an, an organization is, is united, this is not a, not a big problem. I don't think. Everybody thinks uh, uh, this, this is no problem. First question. Why uh, uh, does this organization exist? If everybody knows, this is not a business. This problem when you came to the power, when you in the power, before the power, only money and the power which can kill an organization. <coughs> Nothing else, no, not, not the discussions. Trotsky and Lenin could meet each other in 1970. But they had very big uh, fightings, uh, fights in the in ideological uh, uh, level, on uh, political level uh, uh, before uh, the revolution. And they could unite because they understood what to do. So uh, this is not a real problem if this organization knows what to do. Not to dissolve in the capitalism. This is the end. The other sectarianism, between the uh, Skula and Karibdis, you saw, no, uh, any serious principle uh, um, uh, sentence against uh, the contradictions. No, not this is the real problem. Okay, thanks. Maybe you could not understand what <laughs> I said, no problem. <laughs> okay. It's too short. Thanks, Tarek. Um, <coughs> yeah. Sorry. <coughs> The, quest the question on India uh, is an important one. It, the, the legacy of Lenin, I'm afraid, uh, never totally reached India. Uh, it came via intermediaries, which was the Soviet regime in the late 20s and 30s. Um, and so by the time the Indian Communist Party was formed, Lenin's actual legacy, Leninism, if you, if you like, had already been deformed, twisted, and made into what it was in Russia. And that is all they read, too. All the textbooks came from the Soviet Union. And, you know, the classics were short history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, the problems of Leninism written by committees in Stalin's name, etc. And these were the books on which uh, they were educated. And in some cases, that form of running an organization tied up completely with the old traditions of hierarchy and patriarchy that existed in India, of one person, a guru, giving the instructions and the others listening. People couldn't break from that, and it, it entered into that mold. The Maoists were different. I have to say. And the movements you talk about, which are today fighting in parts of India with the peasants, these were movements which came into being after, largely after the success of the Chinese Revolution, or broke with uh, Moscow orthodoxy. They made many mistakes, as they now themselves admit, but they always remained pretty close and embedded uh, to the people. i just give you one example about eight, nine years ago, maybe a bit longer, the Indian government sent a delegation of top civil servants to Andhra Pradesh to ask the Maoists what they want. What do you want? We are prepared to negotiate. And the Maoist leaders emerged from the underground with white beards, 
and uh, crutches in some cases, surrounded by about 50,000 supporters who sat outside the civil service building in Hyderabad, and they said to the Maoist leaders, what do you want? Tell us what you want. And the Maoist leaders had come well prepared. They said, we want these sections of the Indian constitution implemented. We want these promises made from 1951 to 1962 in all the manifestos of the Congress party implemented. And the civil servants said, these are your demands. They said, yes, implement them and the situation will be transformed, etc., etc. They, the civil servants went back and the Maoists went back. They said, we can't stay talking to you because the cops have been attacking peasant activists again, so bye-bye. Meanwhile, we wait for you to do it. So they have learned something and they're the only people that are fighting. But the communist parties, the traditional communist parties in India are now in a state of crisis. It has to be said, they became like social democratic parties and uh, uh, that was that. To the, the, to the, the comrade who posed the question about capitalism is Just still strong, me. of course. No one is saying it's on the yeah. eve of being overthrown, but people who thought that somehow all was well, that has been proved wrong too. After the 2008 crash, the notion that this form of capitalism that exists, or even milder forms, <clears throat> can solve any real problems for the bulk of the people. That nobody believes now. Hence, you have these you know, sharp upheavals electorally, <clears throat> which if the left doesn't participate in or doesn't try and win over, you create, you have big vacuums uh, uh, created. That's the thing. So obviously, you know, I'm very strongly in favor of doing whatever needs to be done, however small the movement, however limited its demands now, because there's nothing else. You know, Lenin was even in voting in elections to insurance societies because he understood perfectly well that anything that opens up the situation in Tsarist Russia is, uh, um, is, is, is positive. I mean, the one big legacy that we suffer from, <clears throat> and which has already been mentioned, is that this style of creating a single party, ban on factions, ban on discussions, which, by the way, didn't just affect the Stalinist movement, it affected various segments of the Trotskyist movement as well. Uh, as we know, I mean, you know, we know it affected everyone. This has been a huge tragedy for the left uh, as a whole, and we have to learn from it, not to operate in that particular shape or form. It's not necessary, but that's a bit different from the attack on clandestinity, because the Bolsheviks and some left-wing Mensheviks had to be clandestine in order to exist. And people said, well, what lessons does it have for us today? And I say, I don't know, but there might come times again, and there are times in some parts of the world where you have to be clandestine. Mm -hmm. And certainly the resistance movements during the Second World War used this approach of clandestinity. They were trained on it in order to create a resistance that fought back against the Third Reich. Where did that tradition come from? It came from the Soviet uh, uh, Union and it came uh, from uh, Bolshevism. And that's why the Yugoslavs won. That's why the Greeks were on the verge of victory. That's why the, uh, Moscow had to put heavy pressure on the Italian movement to, to cave in and capitulate. So. It's, it's not that everything they did was wrong, and this, will, this clandestinity will um, happen again. I mean, it might take the form of people actually writing letters and having them delivered. Can, can I stop you there? Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, you're more than welcome to join us um, for a, a small drinks reception in uh, the SCR in the first floor in the main building. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>